Hello and welcome to the 121st episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Friday the 29th of May 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week I'm delighted to welcome back Mike McNair to the show. Mike is an Associate Professor of Law at St Hugh's College Oxford and the man responsible for the behemoth that was the Revolutionary Strategy Series. This is the first of a two-parter where we get to ask Mike a lot of questions raised by our reading and discussion of his seminal work. The second part will be released as a Patreon-only episode later in the week. Speaking of Patreon, I have the new patrons M and Kyle Walter to thank. If you liked today's episode and want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month, you get two patron-only episodes every month, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next Reading Group series. Your support really does make this show possible. Okay, let's join the interview. So we had a good few people take part in the thing, I don't know, different people on different episodes and all that kind of stuff. But so some of these are particular questions of people. Some of them are kind of like general points that lots of people were, were interested in or made. So in general, like, I think it's been extremely positively received. So we had somebody mentioned to me that you have a part in your book on the defeatism of Lenin. And in the book, I think you make out the the point is for a defeatism that it only works if all sides of it are want their own bourgeois to be defeated. I think if I'm if I if I'm grasping your points correctly in the book, yeah. This fellow pointed out to me that he doesn't think that that's true. That Lenin actually wanted Germany to win because it was more advanced than Russia. Can, okay, that's fairly yeah. clearly untrue. Uh, and uh, the reason why we know that it's untrue is because of uh, Lenin's very public hostility to Parvus, who did want, Parvus did take the view that Germany should win and argued it. I have actually written, and Ben Lewis has also written on Parvus and the De Glocker group, which was uh, people coming from the left wing of the SPD who advocated for uh, German victory in 1914 and after. And in a sense, there's a sense in which uh, what they were saying had an element of truth in it, which was, in the first place, the the, the uh, German war guilt story is a completely false narrative. This is uh, the Brits decided in 1905 to go in with the uh, Franco-Russian Entente and embark on encirclement of Germany. And then actually, the uh, fairly clearly, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand was in fact a terrorist operation run out of the Serbian intelligence service. So that the case for Austrian invasion of Serbia is identical to the case for the American invasion of Afghanistan. It, but then the, 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 the more fundamental point uh, was that which is argued by Paul Lynch, that is that the incubus which was sitting on the world economy was the obligation to pay tribute to the British financial sector as of the 1890s through 19-teens. And the British Empire was a major obstacle to further modernisation beyond steamships and that st- uh, railways and that stuff. What was delusive in the de Glocker guys was the belief that Germany could defeat the British Empire so that they, they bet the future of the workers' movement on the German victory. But that, but that clearly wasn't Lenin's position, precisely because Lenin polemicised in public clearly against this position. Moreover, absolutely refused to allow Parvus back into Russia when the revolution took place on the basis that he had dirty hands because of the money which he'd taken off the German state for the war operation. So, no, I I, I think it's clear. I, the other side of it, of course, is true what Hal Draper says, that uh, Lenin's defeatism functioned to draw a sharp line within the anti-war left rather than actually being practically used as, a an agitational slogan. However, that's a... Yeah, no, that's just wrong. Sorry. Okay, 
some of these are kind of disjointed. So we're kind of hopping around here. You said yeah, at yeah. one point in the book that you believe the Stalinist USSR was equivalent to a Baathist regime. <laughs> some people found that quite hard. I, certainly if I said it, what I would have meant was basically it's a nationalist regime. It's a tyrannical nationalist regime. In spite of being a tyrannical nationalist regime, it is a, a developmental regime as opposed to it's if you compare Iraq before the uh, sanctions, the, before the Iran-Iraq war and sanctions to uh, Iraq after the American invasion, it's quite clear that uh, Iraq under the Baathist regime, people were better off, the vast majority of people were better off than under the regime imposed by the Americans. And that's true of the uh, Stalinist regime as well, that you know, it, it, with, with the exception of uh, rather small groups of people who have been made better off by the US overthrow of the Soviet state, most people have been made worse off. There is a problem with a large part of the left, which is too willing to buy the uh, Western media narratives of the, this is, quote, Saddam Hussein, personally, or, quote, Assad, personally, this is all about the individual Saddam Hussein, the individual Assad, that's Hollywood. I mean, it's a Hollywood and American New York Times, Washington Post media narrative. As we saw with Iraq, you know, that they sacked everybody who was in any way complicit. And then, of course, you've got no cops, no teachers, no engineers, no et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is it here now. I found it. OK, let me make it big for you here. The USSR under Stalin should be approached as a nationalist Bonapartist regime based on the petty proprietors, like the Brazilian Vargas regime or in modern times the Iraqi Baathist regime, but with rhetoric much further left. This would imply a revolutionary defences policy in some circumstances, like 1941 German invasion. It would not imply such a policy in the case of an agreement with a neighbouring imperialist power, Germany, to carve up the small states in the locality, Finland, Poland and the Baltic states. Yeah. My point is, OK, I, this is um, the, the idea that it was necessary to be pro-Soviet in relation to the Hitler-Stalin pact, yeah, which is what Trotsky was arguing in the in defence of Marxism, on the basis that the Soviet Union would be driven to full Sovietize uh, Eastern Poland, was a political mistake, you know, because you, the cost to the working class of uh, that line is globally global cost to the working class of that line is greater than any advantage which could be gained in Sovietizing Eastern Poland. In addition to which, and this is the other aspect of this story, is, I can't remember the man, Stumbling Colossus, I can't remember the name of the author. In essence, the Hitler-Stalin pact and the Russian intervention in Russian occupation of Eastern Poland moved the Red Army forward out of its prepared defences and away from its line, stores and lines of communication, with the result that when the Germans attacked, the Red Army was in a weaker position in its positions in advanced positions in West East Eastern Poland than it would have been if it had stayed in, in, in its positions in Western Russia. So the, this was part of just as Stalin fucked up the Soviet war effort by killing off the generals, he also fucked up the Soviet war effort by invading Poland. Probably exaggerate that one because I do probably exaggerate that one because the, the, the Trotskyists make such a, a fetish of victoryism in relation to third world opponents of imperialism and victoryism in relation to the Soviet Union that is paradox because they do that simultaneously with a sort of bizarre level of anti-Sovietism. When you say victoryism, what do you mean by victoryism, Mike? The opposite of defensism, that we have to be for the victory of the Soviet Union in any war. Uh, we have to be for the victory of the colonial country, victory to the resistance in Iraq, or the uh, Spartacists say we should fight on the same side as the Taliban. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Because we all know that extreme reactionary religious groups are ahead of bourgeois norms. <laughs> <laughs> right, 
another point here. Let me get this one up here because this is another point from the files. Let me share it again. So this one is from chapter eight, page 144, where basically the question here, Mike, is about where I think you implied in it, the military defeat implied the NEP. So that the NEP was a result of the military defeat. Whereas some people pointed out that NEP was more of a, it was more a function of the inability of the kind of war communism to produce food and the malfunctioning economy that meant the NEP, not so much the war defeat. Okay, yes. In the outset and down to 1921, expected to generalize the European civil war in the short term. And in the civil war in Russia in the 1920 invasion of Poland, the Russian CP had been willing to ride roughshod over national self-determination to carry the arms of the Red Army to the borders of the former Tsarist Empire. In 1920, they hoped to carry them to the eastern borders of Germany, ready to intervene if the German communists could provide the casus belli. Only military defeat held them back here and in Finland and in the Baltic. By 1921, this policy was effectively over. This fact was signalled both by the retreat in Russia represented by the NEP and the turn to the struggle to win the masses urged by the communist parties at the Third Congress. And the answer is, in relation to that, they they accepted that NEP was a retreat. In spite of the fact that, um, as Lars has, Lee has demonstrated, they didn't actually think of war communism as a, a, a good thing or a great way forward. It was just running a war economy required this sort of stuff. But they hoped to spread the revolution by force of arms. We've got, in fact, Lenin's speech, I can't remember who it was, Richardson, I think it was, published a translation after it came, was released in the after 1991 of Lenin's speech to the party congress after the Polish events. It's perfectly straightforward. They thought that there was a chance of victory in Germany if they could get the Red Army on the German border. And if they had victory in Germany, yes, it's certainly true that the question of relations between the worker state and the peasantry is posed completely differently if what you've got is a large market for food in Germany and a large industrial producer producing tech goods in Germany as part of the worker state project. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying they wouldn't have shifted away from war communism in, in the presence of victory, but simply that if they won the war in Poland, the Red Army was on the borders of Germany in 1921. The German communists provide them with a, a casus belli by the March action, which was, again, the part of it was, wasn't just the ultra-leftists in Germany, it was also elements of Comintern were going for. They take, assume they take Germany, it's uh, a different ball. It's a whole different ball game. So the context in which I was writing that, however, was the national question. I mean, I, the, the other side of this, and I don't think I wrote this in this, but I may have done. Look at the Westerners and the Germans, the center element in the German SPD, as opposed to the hard right in the SPD. The center element in the SPD said we can't take power because the Brits and French will overrun us if we do. Uh, the Austrians, we've got this very explicitly in Otto Bauer's history of the Austrian Revolution, which is available in a uh, bridge translation in English, thought we can't take power because the Italian army will overrun us if we do. Meanwhile, the Italians thought we can't take power because the relationship of forces in Italy is insufficiently, isn't, isn't good enough. And the Brits, who were sort of supposed to be the guys who were going to deliver, had army mutinies and strikes and uh, dem uh, soldiers' demonstrations in favour of demobilisation. So that, uh, and actually, a, a industrial action by uh, trade unionists against uh, the intervention in Russia. So that, in my understanding, the fact that the social democracy thought European civil war is not on the agenda. We have to think within national terms. The national framework is uh, why is part of why they didn't achieve power in 1918 to 21. And then, of course, I've said this on a number of occasions, they refused to fight a civil war they could have won in 1918 to 21. That doomed them to fight a civil war they were guaranteed to lose in 1921-23 uh, in Italy and then 
string of subsequent right-wing coups and then 1931 to 33 in Germany, 33 to 34 in Austria. And of course, you wind up with, there is still a European civil war. Mark Mulholland has written about this. There was a lot of killing off of fascist capos and members of the landlord class in 1945-46. But the, the fetish of thinking the relationship of forces exclusively within a single country meant that they put themselves in an awful position. Yeah, it seems like we're just doing a reading group at the moment on the 18th Premier. And in that, you see in, I think, 19, in 1850, when they had the elections that the, the Social Democrats did well in again, and they, they did not seek to follow their political momentum with dynamic action. And it seems to be something, well, I suppose it's an easy thing to get wrong, isn't it? When, when to act and when to uh, hold back. But it certainly seems like the, all of them were afraid of each other's at a point like 1918, surely all of the bourgeois regimes were at a very weak point. You know, yeah, you're hardly that's... going to get them again in such a weak point. That's right. That's right. But I mean, there's a, there's a sense in which there's another acute weak point, but of a rather different kind in 1945, 45, 46. You know, Dennis Healy standing up at Labour Party conference saying, we don't want our army used to suppress the revolution in Italy. And uh, mass communist parties in France and Italy and blah, blah, blah. But then, of course, what the bourgeoisie does in those circumstances is really large scale organized concessions. And that then poses itself in a very different way. I suppose to 1918 21, the question of power is posed and it's posed in the form of European civil war and rejection of thinking about uh, everything as happening within the framework of a single country. 19. 45, 48, uh, the way in which the thing is posed is, OK, radical steps are being taken against the old pre-war order, but we need to attack the constitutional order, not just the economic order. Because uh, the, it doesn't matter how much nationalizations we have, we have massive nationalizations, as long as you've still got corrupt mechanisms of control of elections and of selling and denying justice through the free market and legal services and the insulation of the army officer corps from political accountability. You're giving power back to, you've got power slipping out of the hands of the bourgeoisie and you're giving it back by commitments to the institutional forms. Okay, 45, 48 is different in the sense that there isn't anything like the same level of radicalization in the American army. Although the question of power is posed in a sense, it's, it's, it's more a question of, okay, we need to think about where we're going and not either the sort of um, reenactorism or the take what you can get situation however carry on it's a it, there's a trotsky point as well uh, the the um austrian social democrats decided that they didn't want to fight a civil war in i think it was 31 or 32 over the creation of a bonapartist regime and so they submitted to having heavy weapons taken away from their militia rather than saying you put this guy in as prime minister we fight even demonstratively, you put this guy in as prime minister, we fight, had a potential of making them back off somewhat, not completely, but somewhat. And Trotsky makes the point that this was the moment at which they could have done it. And then they did resist. They had the honor of resisting in 1934, where the Russian, uh, the German Social Democrats and trade unionists and communists just trooped off to concentration camps without a fight. But by allowing the right wing to build up the head of momentum by putting in this Bonapartist character and not saying this is beyond the limits of what's constitutionally acceptable and we fight. The uh, oh dear Curra Mutiny. The Which left we... needed to be willing to do things like the Curra Mutiny and Carson's volunteers and that sort of stuff. Carson had a lot, of, he had support though by the British, didn't he? He had support from the British Tory party. He didn't have the, the Liberal Party, who were actually the government at this time, were uh, pretty hostile to all these operations. This was a coup of the Tory party together with the Unionists against the... It was superseded by the outbreak of the First World War. But, but if, if the First World War hadn't broken out, they were making a coup against the Liberal government. 
the, the, the 18th Brumaire, the time, the timing and momentum point, I think is a very important one. This book doesn't talk about that issue almost at all, because in the first place, we aren't actually in uh, acute revolutionary crisis, even though we're in crisis, economic crisis. But in second place, because it's talking about long term strategy rather than uh, what you do if you've got a mass party and things are fluid and moving one one direction or another. OK, on, on that point that you just said, some people have said that the, the language in the book is somewhat voluntarist, as in a lot of the time it's posed in a way like this person made this decision and this person made that decision. And that is the logic of the here's like, like it's kind of like, you know, these decisions are kind of seem to be nearly primary in your analysis as opposed to like structure of society slash economic stuff at the time. What would you say to that? OK, <laughs> every historical argument involves uh, a, a conflict between a, a, a tension between structure and agency. Indeed, there's a whole load of stuff of Trotsky and other people writing about the role of the individual in history and the point that probably, I'm not quite sure whether it's true, but I think it's quite likely that October 1917 wouldn't have happened but for Parvis persuading the German general staff that it would be useful to them to let Lenin and his immediate co-thinkers travel from Switzerland to Petrograd by train through Germany, the famous sealed train, yeah. And who was actually present? Similarly, actually, I'm not sure whether Lenin's personal views would have made the October because October, the actual decision to go in October in the way in which they did, they decided to go in coalition with the left socialist revolutionaries through the um, uh, military committee of the Petrograd Soviet which they had acquired control of and in the name of the Soviets. And Lenin had sort of moved in the direction of not that long earlier. The Soviets are a busted flush. We're going to have to seize power in the name of the party. So in, in fluid situations, things do turn on individual decisions. But actually, things also turn on individual decisions in other circumstances. Uh, La Salle. It, with his uh, open letter, which was last night, was a, a response to a request for advice from uh, workers' organisations. But uh, Lassalle's open letter triggered the idea of independent organisation of political party, political organisation of the working class, exploiting the suffrage in Germany. Yeah. And then uh, you get LaSalle doing that. If if you just had LaSalle doing that, what you're going to wind up with is a personalist sect, which is what you have in LaSalle's time and then Schweitzer. But Wilhelm Liebknecht and Babel go out against that in favour of and they, they, Marx and Engels were quite unhappy about Babel and Liebknecht and Babel's uh, tactics and policies, but they go out against it on the basis that the uh, workers' organisation has to be de open and democratic. And what you get out of that concrete choice, and then the growth of unification, which again, Marx and Engels didn't like the growth of unification, but the effect of it was um, snowball, that the post gotha organizations grew to a very large extent. I th think it's clear that there are things which th there is an element of structural necessity. Take the SPD. That was the first serious effort at workers' organization in Germany. In the same way in China, the Communist Party, the first separate serious effort at workers' organization in China, and it grows with incredible rapidity from some tens of people to uh, a mass party in the mid-1920s. That's the structural circumstance that you're, you, you've got the present dynamics. But there's also con conscious choices and conscious failures to choose. So the well, we can see in the more recent stuff that where people have gone for unification, it has produced a snowball effect, even though then they've gone for unification on uh, the basis of half social democratic policy. And the consequence of that is then they get trapped and fucked over, as with the 
Brazilian Workers' Party becomes just a player in the clientelist game of Brazilian politics or the SSP, which was, you know, quite politically significant phenomenon in Scotland for a while, makes itself into a cult of the personality of Tommy Sheridan and then is blown up as soon as it becomes clear that he has feet of clay. My my point is, it's always the case there is, I know people say it's voluntarist, but what the hell do they mean by saying it's voluntarist at one level? Everything involves individual choices and choices of quite small groups of people as well as uh, structural dynamics. And it tends to be that the people who say that it's voluntarist are actually just proposing a different voluntarism, which is that uh, if you can actually get people on the streets out on strike, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they will automatically radicalise. I think that's clearly untrue. Okay, let's head for another one here. Okay, this is kind of a a kind of related point was that that there was a criticism, Mike, that the primary focus, obviously, in the book, is on political strategy. And it's kind of isolated from analyzing social context and it kind of operates on like a nearly a, like a purely at a, a political logical level. How is that the case? I don't, it's certainly the case that I don't write about the evolution of the economy. So um, here, let me, let me say it like this, maybe a bit like that, like on, on some, some level, like the trying to put it into the kind of context like we have this idea of what is a good strategy for a, a, a commie party of some sort or a socialist party, whatever we want to call it. You know, the overall tenet of the book is you don't go into government, you build up your forces at a European level, try and infiltrate the army and the armed forces, blah, blah, blah. But like it doesn't, uh, say, talk about what is, say, what are the social conditions that will that allow this to happen or why these social maybe conditions do or don't exist right now. You know, trying to put it into okay. that kind of a social context. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, I take it, I don't, I haven't argued it at great lengths, but well, I have argued it elsewhere, yeah. I take it that capitalism is in decline. I don't say that it's immediately in crisis, but that it's in decline and that in consequence of capitalism being in decline, the question of the working class taking political power is posed and that it's posed in a structural sense, not merely in a, in, in a, in a sense of uh, not merely in an epochal sense. So what do you the, mean by that? OK, there is a sense in which where we are is like the situation of bourgeois revolutionaries between the failure of the Italian city-states in the 14th century and the victory of the Dutch in the Eight Years' War in the Eight Years' War, yeah, 1568 to 1648, and the creation of institutional forms throughout this period and going on actually until after 1689, 1688, 1689, the uh, literature and the consciousness is dominated by the idea that republicanism can't possibly work. You need monarchism because republicanism will inevitably turn into cliques and uh, oppression and the sinister Council of Ten in Venice and the uh, sinister operations of the urban aristocracies of uh, late medieval Italy. We've got that expressed in Shakespeare's plays, in the Jacobean plays, in a play, late one is uh, the play Venice Preserved, uh, which is uh, almost a Romana clef caricature of the Whigs as uh, sinister Venetian aristocrats, as the opposition of sinister Venetian aristocrats. Um, so there's a sense in which that we're in that sort of situation where, in this case, in our case, working class attempted to take power, it failed. The Soviet experience failed. And we keep on the bourgeoisie, just as the uh, feudal classes, the, the church and the aristocracy kept on going on and on and on about the worthlessness of Italian city-states until the point at which the bourgeoisie came up with actual functioning political institutions, particularly the ones after the British state after 1688. We are, in a sense, in that, that sort of situation. But at the same time, it isn't at the level of 
the question of the bourgeoisie in a, taking powers in a sense posed from the first Italian, when the Italian communes first emerged in the 12th century. You could imagine, and people did in the 1200s, as a period of time in which the uh, opposition to Henry III characterised themselves as, quote, the commune of all England. You know, that they're, they're imagining themselves in the sense of a, a autonomous urban government. But we're not in that sense of it's so far down the road that it's a, a purely speculative phenomenon. It's that we are in a situation where capitalism is in decline. We can see that uh, it can't solve, in essence, that the uh, forces of production have outgrown the order of production and have turned into forces of destruction. That's very clear in the uh, global warming stuff, but also actually very clear in the pandemic, but also actually very clear in the endless, endless proxy wars which are going on in third world countries and spreading now into Southeast and Eastern Europe. So it's not just in the third world proper. So the question of doing something differently from capitalism is clearly posed. Secondly, that working class, the, the question of the politics of the working class is plainly posed, is reflected in the fact that we've seen now two, the late 90s Battle of Seattle, globalization movement, and then um, Occupy, and it's just flash in the pan. At the same time, we've seen more solid, but at the same time, at the end of the day, defeated movements in the form of Corbynism in this country, Sanders' movement and the rise of the DSA in the United States, Syriza, as I say, for all defeated and turns out uh, hopeless, but uh, that the idea of a workers' party, the idea of a Labour party, remains something which can, I don't say will, but can create conditions for organising on a more extensive scale. And we need conditions for organising on a more extensive scale because the question, if we're going to overthrow capitalism, we have to have some method of decision making other than the market. Capitalism, the market regime is driving us deeper in the shit. We need some alternative method of organisation. In order to get that alternative method of organisation, we need movement in the direction of cooperation. And that movement in the direction of cooperation is something which the working class is driven to do by virtue of its need for trade unions, its need for tenants associations, its need for cooperatives, its need for working class political parties. So the, the context of this stuff is there is an underlying dynamic which is reflected in things, a series of attempts which have been defeated in different ways. Kosatu in South Africa in the 1980s, the miners' strike in the 1980s, the Brazilian Workers' Party, which I've referred to before, uh, as well as the things which have happened more recently. But the obstacle, as things now stand, is actually quite small groups, is that people try and organise, and then the guys who have experience, who are sort of long-standing experience cater and militants and so on and so forth are committed to forms of organization and political commitments which sterilize it so momentum hey great idea but john lansman turns it into a proprietary news management operation proprietary because it's it's owned it's a comp limited company owned by john lansman <laughs> and all the things which has a national coordinating group etc why does he do? He's backed on in doing that by Jeremy Corbyn and Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell and co, because they think that things basically should be run by the apparat. But that's actually some idea which is shared by guys in the leadership of the SWP, that things should be run by the apparat. And the effect is, therefore, we've got an objective tendency. But this objective tendency is sterilized because people keep doing, hey, it's it's like in our period, I've just been analogizing it to, it's like our period between the, there is an objective tendency for bourgeois organization and resistance, but people keep sterilizing it by putting their trust in princes. The good prince.
yeah, the good prince against his bad advisors. Or we get the, the, the Czech did this bizarre mistake. They threw out, they literally defenestrated the Habsburg, members of the Habsburg government, threw them out the window. But then what did they do? They invited the elector Palatine to come and be king on the basis that he was a Protestant prince. The, the Brits, actually, the English, um, the first part of the English Civil War, they were running on the basis that the generals ought to be aristos. They only actually get to victory when they say, fuck that, we'll point people to be generals who are, and the, the regiments had to be all privately owned by the aristos. Fuck that, we'll create a standing army and appoint people on the basis of competence. This is the new model army. New model ordinance, new model army, self-denying ordinance. They excluded most parliamentarians from the officer corps. So, in a sense, we need to do something analogous. We need to actually break with the way in which we're doing things. So, a kind of repast of that, then, Mike, would be like what we saw with how the Labour Party say emerged. They emerged out of kind of social organising as opposed to political organising. You know, they came from the trade union movement, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, that's, that's, that's at most a half truth. Yeah. What we've got is at the time when the Labour Party emerged, we've got the trade unions deeply embedded in the Liberal Party, just the same as the American trade unions are utterly committed to the US Democratic Party. And uh, the left groups, the ind Independent Labour Party, which is a Christian socialist organisation of about 14,000 and the Social Democratic Federation, which is a uh, Marxist, is generally characterised as a sect, but it's actually rather deeper and more substantial than that, with something around eight to 9,000, start winning elections in local government, not primarily in, centre, in parliament, but they start winning elections in local government. The, the, at the same time, you start getting people agitating for a broader Labour Party in the trade unions and especially in the rail union. OK, these, there's an overlap between the guys who are agitating the people in the ILP and in the SDF who are part of the agitation for a broader Labour Party. There's also actually going there, along with the, the Fabians, who are at the end of the day are the people who actually form the political ideology of the Labour Party, the Fabian Society are advocates of, oh God, what's called in Germany, Cathedra Socialismus, Professorial Socialism. It's oh, odd for me to say that because I actually held an academic job. But the Cathedra Socialists were nationalists uh, who advocated greater state intervention in, in the national interest. And in essence, the Fabians, uh, Shaw, the Webbs and H.G. Wells and so on and so forth, had that character. So these, when the decision to launch the Labour Party is a response to the fact that, that you do actually get some people elected as Lib Lab, Liberal Labour MPs, but the decision to launch the Labour Party as an organisation is a response to the fact that the you know, trade union bureaucracy is losing control, both in the sense that there's an agitation among its own members in favour of a Labour Party, but also and more, I think, immediately that the left groups are winning elections in local government and there's a risk that the result will be the emergence of a German style or French style party which won't have the same friendly relations with the Liberals. Now, of course, once the Labour Party is launched, it continues to be the case that the Labour MPs vote with the Liberal Party on everything except uh, social questions. So the, the pre-war Labour MPs are, in essence, they're half in, half out of the Liberal Party. So I, I just think that it's it, the, it starts with social organising. Yes, social organising is necessary. I'm not saying social organising is not necessary. The problem essentially with social organising is that the capitalist state intervenes to take control. If we look at the cooperative party and the cooperative bank, actually, the capitalist state and the capitalist class, in this case, the cooperative bank, the, yet what happened was that the Gordon Brown persuaded them to bail out bankrupt building societies by taking them over and they bankrupted the bank. 
but more generally, what we get is, quote, themocracy imposed by regulatory legislation created by government to insist that cooperatives have to be characterized by have one man management operations and at most very slight supervision by their membership. And the same in relation to trade unions that we have regulation. We also have regulation, in fact, of political parties see, requiring them to have, quote, a leader, etc., etc., etc. So that the point about a workers' party in the Marxist sense is that because it is antagonistic to the constitution, it enables cooperativism, trade union militancy, and so on and so forth to get be more free than can be the case with a party which is loyalist, as the Labour Party is, basically a loyalist party. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Phronic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats.